Welcome back to our lecture series, Math 1060, Trigonometry for Students at Southern Utah University. As usual, I'll be the professor today, Dr. Andrew Misseldine. In lecture 29, we're going to continue our discussion of vector applications. That is, we're going to be looking at various force and velocity diagrams involving vectors and using our notions of trigonometry to help us answer questions related to these vector applications. Uh, in the previous video, we learned about something called static equilibrium. Static equilibrium is when you have an object that is not in motion, and that's because all the forces acting on that object add together to form the zero vector. We had an example of a little boy on a swing uh, whose sister was holding him up, but that was in static equilibrium. We were able to solve that one by creating a right triangle and just using some basic Sokotoa trigonometry to help us out here. In this example, I want to consider a situation that's similar, it's in static equilibrium, but not as simple as the previous example. This time, imagine that a traffic light that weighs 22 pounds is suspended by two wires shown in our diagram here. So what do you want to think of right here is our traffic light. So we have red, yellow, green. I clearly didn't color code that very well. Um, but it's being suspended by a wire, right, of some kind. So it's like you have this wire right here. You put a hook onto it. It's probably secured more than this. But the weight's going to sag the wire down like so. So your little dangly thing is sagging the wire down uh, like so. And so then we get a diagram that looks something like this if we think of it just in terms of vectors, okay? Uh, for which the we'll take point A right here. That's the location of the traffic light. It has a weight of 22 pounds right here. So the weight, the, the weight here is going to be 22 pounds. And the direction is going to be downward because its weight is the force due to gravity. So let's consider these other points, B and C, as you see here on the diagram, right? So this is our rope. This is where the ropes are connected, B and C right here. And so we could ask ourselves, what is the tension along the wires AB and along the wire AC like so? Well, when it comes to static equilibrium, since the since the, the light is not falling to the ground or going in any other direction, the sum of all three of these arrows has to equal zero. And so let's suppose that the angles formed with respect to the vertical are the following. So when you take tension one and tension two, uh, so tension one will be the tension from the light to the right, and then tension two will be the tension from the light to the left, like so. And so with respect to the vertical, these angles will form 60 degrees and 45 degree angles. Uh, so to the right, you get the 60 degree angle. To the left, you get a 45 degree angle. Notice, of course, when you add those together, 60 degrees plus 45 degrees, you do not get 90 degrees. It's actually too big in that regard. And so this isn't going to be a right triangle when we're done. All right, but that, that, that doesn't mean that we can't handle this thing. It just means we have to kind of change our perspective a little bit. All right, so what we're going to do is I want to redraw this, this, triangle, uh, this diagram into a triangle to make life a little bit easier for us. So basically what I want to do is I want to move this vector down below here. So we're going to get a vector that looks like this. It's going to run parallel to it. This is T1. And then I'm going to move this vector over here. So you get something like this. Here's T2. Honestly, this is sometimes the most difficult part of these static equilibrium problems, moving the vectors around to form a triangle or a parallelogram, whatever the shape turns out to be, making sure you move things in such a way, and you're going to keep things parallel. So the alternate interior angle theorem is going to come into play several times in this type of diagram. Our, our, the point of this is we know that T1 plus T2 plus W is equal to the zero vector because we're in static equilibrium. They're going to all add up to B that in the end. So we're trying to form a triangle like we do right here. Okay. And so I have a secret picture of that down below. So when we move those things around, we're going to get the following. All right. But how do the angles correlate in this situation? Well, we got to take a look at that as well. So come back up, hide the secret picture. Uh, so in terms of angles, what's going to happen here? So think of this line right here. Let me draw it on the screen. Uh, my, my sketch was somewhat poor in that regard. But if we just basically move uh, T2 down this direction, right? So it actually stays collinear with its original location, right? We have this line right here. And therefore, these angles 
are going to be vertical angles. So they're going to be congruent to each other. So that gives us that this is a 45 degree angle. Uh, also, if we take, say, this line associated to T2, we just translated it over here so that it's parallel. What can we say about congruent angles in that situation as well? I'm going to insert a vertical line uh, through this point right here just for the sake of it. So then we get by the alternate interior angle theorem again. This angle right here would correspond to this angle right here. So this is likewise 45 degrees. And to the right of that, this one would be 60 degrees like so. So then with respect to these white lines that you see right here, right? With respect to those white lines, which are parallel, this red line transverses them as well, thus forming by corresponding angles, a 60 degree angle right there as well. So that's kind of messy. Let me come back here and summarize what we've discovered. Uh, so what we've discovered so far was that this angle right here is 45 degrees. This angle is also 45 degrees. Uh, this angle right here would be 60 degrees. And then the sum of the triangle, some of the angles of triangle need to add up to be 180 degrees. We've accounted for a 45 degree angle, a 60 degree angle. And so this last one would then have to be 75 degrees to add everything correctly. The weight, like we observed earlier, is going to be 22 pounds, like so. And so with this information, we are going to try to solve for the tension of T1 and T2. So we need to find the tension of T1. We also want to find the tension of T2. How are we going to do that? This is not a right triangle anymore. Um, what can we do to relate the side, to find the sides here? Well, the law of sines actually is an appropriate tool here because we know the length of this side. We know its corresponding angle. This is an AOS, an angle opposite side. And so since we know this AOS, we can solve for the other AOSs. If we want to find T1, we'll then look at this AOS versus that AOS. And so the law of sines comes into play to help us find T1. So T1 over sine of 45 degrees, this will equal, of course, the weight divided by sine of 75 degrees, for which then we could try to compute these things solving for T1. We end up with, well, clear the denominator time both sides by sine of 45 degrees. The weight of the, of the light was 22 pounds, so we get that. We're then gonna get sine of 45 degrees right here. But sine of 45 degrees, we know what that is. That's root two over two. So I'm just gonna put that in there, root two over two. And then we get sine of 75 degrees. Now sine of 75 degrees, we actually did do this once upon a time uh, using the angle sum identities for sine here. We thought of sine of, 40, of 75 as sine of 30 plus 45 degrees. And so remember previously, we got the square root of six plus the square root of two all over four, like so. Um, to make life a little bit easier for us though, we're gonna factor out from the denominator the square root of two over two. So we get 22 over root two over two. And then if you factor out root two over two from the, from the sine of 75 degrees, like so, that leaves behind the square root of three plus one over two. And so then these square roots of two over two will cancel out. And then you're dividing by a fraction, so let's multiply by the reciprocal. And we end up with 22 times two over the square root of three plus one. And while I don't think there should be mandated rationalizing denominators, uh, this is a situation where rationalizing the denominator actually does simplify this expression here. So we're gonna times the top and bottom by the square root of three minus one. Uh, on the top, you're gonna end up with 22 times two times the square root of three minus one. In the denominator, uh, you're gonna end up with the square root of three times square root of three, which is three. And then you're gonna get a minus one, like so, which is a two. This two will cancel with the factor of two in the denominator, thus giving us the exact value of 22 times the square root of three minus one. And let's approximate this, and we would end up, if we round to the nearest, the nearest pound, we end up with 16 pounds. And so that's the tension along the first wire, T1. Well, to find the tension along the second wire, T2, um, we're just going to do another law of sines situation. We're going to use uh, this AOS this time. So we have that the tension along T2 over sine of 60 degrees. This is going to equal 22 over sine of 75 degrees. Clearing the denominators, or that's to say times both sides by sine of 60, we end up with 22 times sine of 60. Sine of 60 is root 3 over 2. 
And then the denominator, we have another root two over two times the square root of three plus one over two, like so. Well, let's try to simplify this thing a little bit. Um, in so doing, we can at least cancel out these divisors of two like so, and then multiplying by reciprocals again, we'll end up with a 22 times the square root of three uh, divided by the square root of two, and then we get two over the square root of three plus one, like so. And we did the same, we're gonna do the same trick we did before. Let's times by the conjugates here, square root of three minus one, square root of three minus one, like so. Um, so the square root of three plus one times square root of three minus one, that gave us a two again, so that's gonna cancel with those. So what do we have now? We have a 22 times the square root of three times the square root of three minus one. This sits above the square root of two. I'm gonna distribute the square root of three right here. And we're gonna get 22 times three minus the square root of three all over the square root of two. Yikes, where did the two go there? And then the last thing I wanna do, again, trying to continue with this rationalizing here, I'm gonna times the bottom by two, square root of two, the top by the square root of two, like so. Distributing the square root of two on the top here, you're gonna get 22 times three root two minus the square root of six, in the bottom, you get a two now. Two does go into, a, into 22 11 times. So we end up with, as the exact value, 11 times three times the square root of two minus the square root of six, uh, for which an approximation seems very appropriate. This is approximately 20 pounds of tension. Like so. so we were able to still handle this static equilibrium problem, but we didn't have a right triangle. We had an oblique triangle. And so when working with oblique triangles, the skills we developed in the previous chapter about the law of sines and law of cosines becomes very relevant. When you have a choice, I would suggest the law of sines. It's typically the easier approach, uh, but sometimes the law of cosines might be appropriate, although we didn't see that in this exercise.